Welcome to our um, online event today. We are going to be talking about machine quilting on your domestic machine. Now, I know this is an area that a lot of people have a lot of questions about. So this is going to be the forum for you to get into the comment section, put in your questions, and then they'll feed me those questions so we can try to cover specific questions you might have about machine quilting on your domestic machine. No, the portion that we're going to cover today is kind of the um, the tools and setup and all the things we have to consider before we actually get to the machine quilting. We do have a plethora of videos out there um, on our website and National Quilter Circle about free motion. So other tips and tricks of the actual stitches, ideas, um, how to position hands and do some of that and get the rhythm of machine quilting, even your posture sitting at the machine. So our, my moderator today or my, my behind the scenes person is going to put up a link so that you can then follow that to more videos to learn more about machine quilting. Because for most of us as quilters, we tend to advance quite quickly in our piecing skills our cutting ability, how to use tools. But the machine quilting part tends to lag just a bit, little bit because we as quilters, as soon as we can see a constructed top, our patchwork and the color and the secondary designs, and we put it up at the design wall, we're like, yes, I'm finished. The borders are on. And we quickly fold it up and put it away saying, when I get to it, I'll machine quilt it. Well, let's, this is back up and see if we can pull out some of those things and start the process of getting it prepared and getting you ready for machine quilting. And if nothing else, maybe make a practice sandwich so that you can then pull out these things we're going to talk about today, consider the best method for you, what works best with your machine, and then maybe you can make some progress on that stack of to be quilted <laughs> that are stored away in drawers and dressers and closets everywhere. So um, make sure that you also drop in. Let me know where you're watching from. Again, those questions you have, please start generating those so that I can address those as we work through this. We're going to talk about uh, preparing that quilt top. We're going to talk about basting and different options. We're going to talk a little bit about thread. We are going to talk about quilting aids that help you grasp your, your quilt sandwich. And we're going to talk about what kind of presser foot, what do I, where do I start? So if those topics pique your interest, drop your question into the comment section so that they can be fed to me here in my studio. So first off, I have to say today is birthday. Not my birthday, but many birthdays in my family. I just want to give a quick shout out that my dad's birthday would have been today. His twin birth brother's birthday was also then today. His brother born one year young, uh, later would have been today. My future daughter-in-law's birthday is today. And we're in the process of having a grandson born today. So five birthdays, one day, one family. How much fun is that? So it's celebration. So <laughs> we are awaiting that new grandson and you know, when you're working on quilting projects, so smaller ones, especially baby quilts and quilt um, table toppers, those are the perfect places to practice that domestic machine quilting that you can do yourself on your machine. I know it's scary jumping in. A lot of times I used to resort to this, the seam ripper, because I would put some quilting in and then think, I'm just not sure if it's good enough. Well, put this away. Let's get everything set up and let you just have some fun practicing and maybe not tear out so many things. We have um, good mornings from Melody in Oregon. Good morning. Zena says good morning from sunny but chilly Florida. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean because we went from 80 degrees here one day to uh, two days later having snow and blowing wind. So we slid 50 to 60 degrees in about a 48 hour period. Um, there are many people who have birthdays say happy birthday. Well, thanks. Um, birthdays are special because each of us is, is unique and our machine quilting is unique to us too. It's similar to your signature. Now, everyone realizes that when you write your signature, no matter how pretty or how mm, fast it's put, 
put down on paper. It's unique to you. And you will find that your machine quilting is very unique to you also. It's kind of like your signature on the quilt. So let's jump in. And um, I've got a couple of examples here. I was ready to start machine quilting on something. And then I thought, oh, stop. We'll use that as, as a jump off for um, our class tomorrow. So here we are. Um, this is going to be one that's in the queue, ready to go. But I wanted to address one that's coming up, a pattern that you'll be able to download in, in the future. It's not on the website yet. It quite didn't quite get there fast enough for Easter. Um, this is a pattern that I call Easter peepers. And it has little um, chicks with uh, little bunny ears. And it was an Easter print that I wanted to make a tabletop. So this pattern will be out there available eventually on our website. Remember, National Culture Circle offers you so many perks. We have those videos. We have free patterns. Remember that as a resource and share it with your friends, please. Um, this is an example of when you get started quilting and you don't know where to stop. <laughs> because I didn't know for sure how much I wanted to quilt on this or where, where to actually start when I sat, sat down to it. Every project's like that. Every quilter, no matter how experienced, always has that moment of thought of where do I start? And where do I stop? Because there's so many different areas within a quilt to work on. And in this one, I'm just gonna review really quickly and then we're gonna jump into all those things to prepare. Now, the biggest thing that we're gonna talk about in the very end of this is putting in the bones to our, um, and the structure into our quilt when we're doing the machine quilting, which means doing some stitch in the ditch. And I know that sounds extremely boring, but there is a track for you to follow. So that one you don't have to be as creative about. But to do that, um, stitching to outline sections so that um, it gives the block structure and we don't get very much distortion then when we're actually doing the rest of the quilting in there. This one, I did the structure. So I went around almost every shape in here with um, kind of an outline in the ditch stitching and then went back and did free motion in the in the white areas. I don't know if ah, there the camera, the shadowing can pick it up. There's the white is pulled back to recede. There is a simple little curly line in the narrow yellow border, a simple meander in that outer border because the pattern, the fabric is so busy already, you wouldn't see what I was doing much in there anyway. So why take extra time to put um, a motif in that area? So a simple loop and does, uh, meander goes in that outer border. And then I did a little bit of a highlight in the yellow um, that goes around these, that's inside these stars. Just some straight lines, some very simple straight lines to kind of give that pop. And then I left the center and the turquoise star points without quilting because that raises it up. So those are kind of some of the things we start to think about when we sit down to start machine quilting. Now, this is an upcoming project. So Christmas in July is going to happen. And um, I've got something, of course, with Christmas print, some red and green, and I need to machine quilt this. So let's go back and figure out where do we start? What do we do? The first, very, very first thing and, that you need to do is make sure that your quilt top is well pressed. Those seams on the back, you don't want, um, you want them to have a direction, a home to go. Because when you start to baste and layer your um, quilt top, you want them to be as flat as possible. They're not always going to lay flat. There always will be some thickness as you get intersections of seams, like in these where there are a lot of triangles. You can try to do as opposing seams as much as possible. But having them at least have some kind of a memory of which direction you intend them to lay will make your quilt top lay flat and that basting process will be much easier. So when a pattern tells you to um, join, say, units into a row and then press, make sure you follow that last instruction to go and press maybe seam allowances all to the left or all to the right. Do that process because it makes that last press so much faster 
that you don't have to fight with the nose of the iron because trying to iron an entire quilt top is a daunting project. <laughs> so if you're doing a row at a time as you join pieces and you're pressing those, you give that fabric a memory, a direction to go. And then as you join rows, it's a much easier task to um, press that, that row and then the next as you join it. So make sure that you don't skip the pressing process. Many of us want to just keep sewing and think, oh, I'll press later. And then you find yourself trying to get down between rows with the nose of the iron and get things to lay flat. So don't step that, uh, skip that process. Um, I, I know that some of you have heard that you already have good um, skills at pressing and you always have good best um, practices. But those who are beginners, Press as you go. It makes life simpler. Um, let's see. We have Teresa who says her seam ripper is Jack the Ripper. Yeah, sometimes we do have to resort to seam ripping. There are times when I put in machine quilting and I'm going along in the ditch really nice. And all of a sudden, the needle takes a bite into the wrong section. That's where you make sure you stop then, take it out and address it right away. Because later it's really hard. <laughs> on a big project, sometimes you think, oh, I'll, I'll be able to find that later. It, it makes it difficult sometimes to, to um, identify those areas later. So, yeah, there are times when the seam ripper does come in ha handy. And Roxy says, I was told that I needed to not put binding on until I was done quilting the quilt. That is correct. Um, the little Easter paper project that I showed you, the binding is on because that project is done. This is just sandwiched. There is no binding yet. We've got backing, we've got the batting, and we've got the top. The binding is set upstairs, all prepared to go on, but the machine quilting needs to be done first because in the machine quilting process, there might be a tiny bit of shift here and there so that you will have maybe a tiny bit of fullness, and you want that to work its way out to the edges before putting the binding on. Because if you put the binding on first, you've now locked in the alignment. And if there is a tiny shift, as you work toward an outer edge, you might get a buckle of fabric and it has nowhere to go. The binding is now locked it into place and you will get a fold in your quilt top. So that binding is always best to be put on after the machine quilting is complete. So good tip, something to remember. Okay. Now, once we have our quilt top nicely pressed, also go in and press the backing fabric. Now, these are probably my best buddies in the in the sewing room. Um, they were products that at the time I was like, really, one more product? Do I really want to do that? Because I've used a, a misting bottle and that works fine. But sometimes it's a good thing to use a little bit of um, a spray starch or spray sizing. It helps those outer pieces um, have a little bit more stabi stability and you get less fraying on the outer edge. So best press is something I will use well while I'm actually doing my cutting or before I do my cutting so that my pieces have a little bit more stability. Because if I'm going to machine quilt it, I'm going to be handling it through the machine and that keeps my patchwork nice and crisp and um, gives it a little bit more body as I'm actually getting to that process. The other product made by the same company, didn't want to like it either, but it works. It is um, press, uh, a product called I Hate Ironing. And the, the inventor of this must have known me because I really don't like to iron. Um, and it talks about using it on garments and things, but quilters, of course, always find uses for things. Now, as I was laying this out yesterday and basting the layers together, this backing fabric had some horrible, horrible wrinkles in it. There's still one little line here, but there was one of those, it was wadded on the bolt and I could barely get it to lay flat. I hate ironing, misted it, laid, just kind of swiped my hand across it so that any you know, residue was on the fiber, really nice. I laid it to the side oh, in another room, didn't want to look at it. And I came back 10 minutes later and those fibers had totally relaxed. And as you can see, it did not have 
any of those wild, crazy wrinkles left in it. Because if this backing fabric has wrinkles in it, you may end up quilting the wrinkles actually into it with a fold even. Um, so trying to press your backing fabric is just as important as a good press on the um, actual patchwork portion of your quilt. So I Hate Ironing is a product um, made by, um, got to get it, Mary Ellen's. That's the, the same company that makes the best press. So uh, those are two products that I enjoy using. Like I said, didn't like, didn't want to like them, but I absolutely fell in love with them because they make the process um, faster, more efficient. It gets the wrinkles out, even those ones where it's been on the bolt and it got crushed like that. And it's been like that maybe for, you know, a year and a half. So that really eliminates those wrinkles. So the pressing is really vital to nice flat surface when you're working, um, putting it into um, your domestic machine to get it quilted. Michelle asks, I make my own um, stiffener with water and vodka. That is exactly what is in Best Press. It's potato starch and vodka is a starch. <laughs> so I know that there is a recipe for that online. So you can Google um, fabric stiffener or fabric um, uh, homemade st spray starch, homemade Best Press, and you will come to the um, recipe that makes that. So another hack that quilters like to use. Okay, so we've got everything pressed and ready to go. The next thing is basting our layers together. And if you follow me at all on video, you know that my best buddy for um, putting my layers together is um, a spray adhesive called KK2000 made by Sulky. This is my go-to product. It's not overly sticky. It um, doesn't put fumes too much into the air. It seems that um, I don't have a lot of overspray. A small bottle goes a long way. I know that there are some of you who don't want to use any kind of propellant, may have lung issues, do not want to spray this. That's fine. So the other option is to um, either pin based or actual hand baste the layers together. I know there are a few other options out there. Some people use a combination of a, a water glue solution with a brush and they put it on and put the layers together, let it dry. Well, it was a washable glue, so it washes out. Um, I've never tried that one, but I have seen video of people using that. Um, some will use some uh, kind of a, a adapt adaptation of a glue stick kind of layering. Um, I found, though, that the spray base works best for me. Before I got in the spray brace, spray based, try and say that quickly, um, multiple times, um, I did pin basting. So the safety pins, the small, um, like one and a quarter inch, I think, or one and an eighth inch pins are the ones that I was taught to use originally. Um, there are safety pins larger out there that have the bent um shaft on them like this, which makes it a little bit easier to get a bite down into the layers and get all the way through the batting and backing. Um, on these though, make sure that you take a big enough bite so that there isn't shift in the layers because the larger the pin, the bit a bit more shifting can happen. So make sure that you take a, you know, a decent bite into the fabric there so that you don't get shift as you're quilting. Um, the only thing I found with these is every time I pinned in an area, that's usually where I wanted to quilt. And so I was putting them in, taking them out over and over again. Um, but pin basting works and it's fairly efficient. Um, the other thing is, and I had a needle and thread here. Oh, uh, I'm not wearing it, so I'm not sure where I went off to. But to use a needle and thread to actually do a um, hand basting, Let me lay it up here. Um, you can actually just do a long running stitch with a needle and thread um, so that the layers are basted together, but they need, they can be very long stitch. You can use a really long needle for that um, in different directions so that you don't get a shift. Um, you can Google that process to see video. I don't know for sure if we have a hand basting video at our website, but there are ones out there. We'll tell you, you know, how how far apart to do the basting and in multiple directions so that you make sure that you lodge the layers together efficiently. So hand basting is one way to do it. Pin basting is another. Um, a spray based is a third. So those are all 
options for getting the layers to stick together because you need to act, have them act as one when you move it to the machine. So basting is really important. Try not to just get by with a few pins because that's when you're going to get the shift of the layers. Because when you put batting between two pieces of fabric, it's kind of like putting a pillow between your hands. You, you push down on that. And if you move one hand in one direction and one hand in the other, there's kind of that wiggle of the pillow layer. And even though your batting may be fairly thin, um, mine is quite thin, you still get a bit of a shift. So that's why we want to base those layers and get that sandwiched really nicely together. Judy asks in a question here, I saw a powder that is supposed to be used for basting that you iron to make it stick. I have seen that product. Um, I've seen a demo of it. It works fine. Um, I can't offhand remember the name of the product. It's like on the tip of my tongue, but now I cannot think of it. But if you were to Google that, um, a powder basting product, I'm sure that it will pop up immediately. Um, that way, it's another product. It's not going to be aerosol. Aerosol? Uh, it's not going to be spread throughout the air. <laughs> powder that you can be very direct about where you're placing it on the batting. So that is another product that can use um, that you can use. Sharon asks, um, hello from uh, ILK. Man, I will have to Google to figure out where ILK is because I have a feeling it's not in the United States. The question is, what color thread should we use when stitching in the ditch on a multicolor quilt, such as red, white, and gray? Good question, because you know what? The next topic we're going to talk about is thread selection. So you are inside my head. Perfect. I love it. Okay, so we've got everything pressed. We've got it basted. We've got our sandwich ready to go. But now it's the tough decision. What kind of thread do I want to use? And do I need top thread and bottom and the bobbin to match? So here we go. When it comes to um, machine quilting, it is always the dilemma of what color thread should I use and what will be the best to kind of disappear when I'm doing that stitch in the ditch. Because I've had that dilemma in my head today also. Um, this, I chose to put a very light color backing on this project. And if I were to use red throughout, a lot of times I try to match my top and bottom thread color so that I don't get, if my, and I'm saying, yeah, not every, not, it, it won't always happen with everyone, but if my balance, my thread balance isn't perfect on tension, if there's a tiny pull one direction or the other, I don't want to see an unusual color pop up. And if the thread color matches on the top and on the bobbin, I won't notice as much if it's off just slightly because I know getting thread tension balance perfect can be a chore for some machines. So by using that matching color, sometimes we can get by without quite perfection, but close enough that we're comfortable that the um, threads are locking very close to center. So on this, I think, that if you're doing something multicolor, a lot of times my default is a gray thread, a medium gray thread. Now, if you go too light, almost all colors, light gray, light yellow, light pink, light blue, almost all of them will read white or almost white when you go to stitch them in with one thread width in, the, in your project. So do a little bit of a um, auditioning on your thread color before you start. That means to take the thread itself and just kind of puddle it onto your project and see what happens when you see that color go across different portions. So on this, I have a red thread and I'm gonna puddle that out on my project and I can see it on the white, but it's not terrible. Of course, it disappears completely on the red and on the green, it just looks Christmassy. It's it's not really offensive. On the gray thread here, of course, it's going to disappear on the white. It's not not very noticeable on the green, but it really screams on the red. So the dilemma is what to do. As I was thinking about this this morning, 
what I believe I will end up doing is that when I go to put the bones into this quilt, I am going to start with a white thread. I know that seems really crazy because I don't even have white thread in front of me. But I'm going to start with a white thread and I'm going to do in the ditch on all of the white portions first. So I'm going to start towards the center because you should always start towards the center and work your way out. Um, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put in those outlines in the ditch. Now that since I want to use white because I don't want to really see too much of that and I want white on the back, I'm going to stitch just a tiny bit off the ditch. Instead of trying to stay right in it, I'm going to stay right beside it and outline just to the inside of all of these white sections, starting here, working my way out so that I have all of that lodged. Then I will probably switch over and I will end up with multiple colors on the back of my project. And sometimes you just have to accept that it's going to have multicolor on the back because I will probably come in here and do um, a bit of stitch in the ditch here. And it may be red because I'll probably run just inside the ditch so that I get this portion outlined and held down. And then I will work my way out, probably working on the outside are all of these red sections so that I work just toward the red side of the ditch. And by the time I get the red pieces and the white pieces down, I've pretty much outlined everything. I may come in and with a little bit of green and do just across in the center if it needs, looks like it needs to be held down there also. And then go back and put in the fun quilting. I may do some fun in the red areas to kind of accent the lines. But those that ditch stitching will be first, um, first and foremost. So either the white or the red, something that will... Actually, I might reverse that order. I may do the red first. Because by doing that, I'm really close to the center here and just run just towards the red side of the ditch. You're going to see that thread, but that's okay. It's better than wobbling in and out of bright and dark. So by just doing that outlining there, I will have lodged a lot of it, and then I may go back and do any white areas that need to be um, kind of reinforced. Actually, if I did all the red, now that I think of it, I would have ditched all of this white anyway. So <laughs> there you go. The process is kind of one of those, once you get into it, you go, wait, wait, wait. I should start with this one instead because the logic starts to come into focus much more clearly. Um, let's see. We have, and you're doing the multicolor. I wanted to address that really quick. Multicolor, gray tends to be my go-to thread even when I do long arming because a medium gray tends to reflect the colors around it and be very um, subtle, unless you want to see the machine quilting a lot, the uh, medium gray will be very subtle, probably kind of just be in the background holding things down. If your multicolor is on the darker side, more into navies or um, some of that, I might go to more of a medium, medium, dark gray, but I would try a gray first because sometimes it's really surprising how those that kind of just rides the, the rail in between and kind of reflects the color around it. Sue is asking, how long can you wait to quilt after you use the 505 spray? Will the glue dry up? Yes. Um, I believe on the canister, it will tell you specific, specifically on the 505 spray, how soon after. Most of those kind of the tackiness is there, but not enough to um, obstruct the machine. So um, double check on the 505, but I'm most um, certain a lot of people I know use it. And I don't think it is a very long wait before it, you can go to the machine. It, it pretty much adheres itself to um, your fabric and it doesn't usually transfer to the needle on your machine. That's where you get into skipped stitches and issues with stitch quality when you have too much glue or tackiness and it builds up on the needle of the machine. So good question. Oh, Illinois. <laughs> okay. So ILK was actually IL for Illinois. So you're just by next door neighbor to the east. Very good. Teresa asks a friend of hers keeps um, miss, uh, the scrap, misty scraps and uses those for basting. Oh, okay. 
So a little bit of a fusible material, scraps of that in between. That's one way to go. It's not as repositionable as other um, ways of basting, but once you get used to doing a process, whatever works for you, go for it. Okay, so we've talked about the thread tops and bot top and bottom, um, keeping maybe the color to match and sometimes having to realize that you're going to have different colors appearing on the back of your quilt, unless you can get maybe a medium gray to read across the entire thing. If I'm stitching with red on top, I'm going to put red on the bottom because I don't want that accidental pull of pokies coming from the bottom. And, um, and in order to get a perfect balance of red thread on the top and white on the bottom is going to be almost impossible. And I figure why not just eliminate the stress of that portion and just accept that the back is going to have some colorful thread on the back. That's okay. Uh, let's see. We have any other questions? Nope, not right now. So we, uh, when it comes to thread, also thread size, you can get heavier weight threads. You can get finer weight threads. You can get threads with a sheen to them. The biggest thing to consider is whatever thread weight you use on the top, in the top part of your machine, the same weight needs to be in the bobbin. This will give you the best balance on your machine quilting. If you try to use a really fine thread in the bottom and a heavier weight, maybe a, a, a 40 weight thread in the top because you really want to see the thread, you're going to have a little bit more problem getting a balance because of the size of the thread. So keep that in mind, same size or weight of thread in the bobbin as in the top of your machine. So um, a clarification, spray basting a quilt in October. Mm, that's that's a fun time. Um, have not had a chance to quilt it. Well, spray, spray basting that um, will it have lost its tackiness? Not usually. I have had things spray basted for months. And if they're stored properly, they usually are still adhered when I've taken them out more than six months later. So I would say your chances are probably pretty good that the tackiness is still there enough. It may not be repositionable. The pieces may be, you know, they're, they're stacked, they're adhered. And it's ready to go. If you peel back and try to reposition, you may have to reapply some of the spray base. But I have had good luck with the, the layers staying together, not drying it out, so that when I took it out later, it didn't just fall apart. You know, here's the top, here's the batting, and here's the backing. So if you did store it, that's it should still be there. So fingers crossed that you can just sit down and start machine quilting. Okay. Um, We've gotten through thread. Oh, we need to keep going here quick because we have a lot left to cover. Okay, quilting aids. Really quick. I've got two other big topics I want to cover here. Okay. When I go to machine quilt and when I was first learning, I would grab the fabric and I was trying to manhandle it through the machine. And then I realized that doesn't really work very well. You end up with a lot of tension in your shoulders. You, you're gripping your hands, your elbows, your, your uh, wrists. Everything is overworked. And grasping the fabric that tight is not the most smooth and productive way to machine quilt on your domestic machine. So I have learned that gloves are my friend. Um, a lot of times I've used machingers. These are really lightweight um, polyester kind of a glove that has uh, tacky fingertips on it. And as you can see, they get a little dirty when they've been used a lot, but these work really nice. Um, another style of glove is similar to a, um, a glove you might find for gardening. If you don't like a polyester kind of fabric, these are cotton, so they're more breathable. Um, they have the little tacky beads on the inside. The only thing that I found with the cotton gloves is that if you have fingernails, and you do a lot of machine quilting, um, you will find yourself wearing them out. As you can see, my fingernail went through this one and my fingers went through um, the tips of these because these are the fingers I use the most to drive and grasp the fabric. With my hands on, these are the ones I'm maneuvering my quilt top with. So 
Um, Miss Shingers tend to last a little bit longer for me. Um, I have a set of mismatched ones because, you know, finding ones, I had extras in the drawer and I just pulled out a left and a right because I was tired of having holes. Miss Shingers works really, really probably the best for me. There are finger, little finger gloves. Um, I have tried using these and they are maybe not the ticket for me. They are just covers for your fingertips. They're almost like the tips off of a rubber glove. So you could do that, I suppose, too. But these will give you um, the capability to um, pick up other items because when you have a glove on it, everything feels kind of clumsy. But these little finger um, cots or finger gloves give you the ability to just put them on a few fingers. And that gives you the grip because they have kind of a, a textured um, surface to them that grips the fabric really nicely. So you can put those onto fingers that are um, that you need to use to maneuver the entire quilt up. And you wouldn't have to have all of your fingers covered, just um, those that are um, a few of them to give you the grip. There are other things like um, quilting um, harps or arcs like this. Um, this came with one of my sewing machines. It has kind of a rubberized gasket on the bottom. It gives you something to grip here to maneuver. Um, I've done a little bit with this, but it's not my go-to. The gloves are my go-to because I like to use my hands more than gripping this. I felt like pushing down and shoving at the same, or maneuver, maneuvering at the same time, but it may work for you. Another product out there, and I don't have, um, I've used them before, but I don't have a set of them myself. There are discs that are um, kind of a foam rubber that you lay down, they grip the fabric also, and you can maneuver the fabric with those. Depending on, you know, what's comfortable on your hands or your fingers, find one that works for you. Ask at your local quilt shop because they will direct you to the products that are the most popular sold in um, their shops. The last one that I want, or a couple that I want to get to here is, is when you're going to go in and do that stitch in the ditch. This is the time that that free, um, that um, walking foot or even feed foot is a necessity. Because if you're new to quilting, a lot of machines don't come with a walking foot. It has to be purchased after uh, either you negotiate to get one put into your package as you buy a sewing machine, or you have to go back and find one that fits your machine. Now, different companies make theirs. There's There are some universal ones out there maybe not as good try to get one made by the company that makes your machine so that it fits properly this goes over there's a little lever on it it goes over the thread take up or the needle um screw i'm sorry then where you place when you put your your needle into your machine there's a screw or a bar there this goes on that needle take up so that um, it moves up and down with the needle it gives you um, feed dogs are kind of a feed dog effect on the bottom, um, similar to the feed dogs on your sewing machine. So you're feeding both top and bottom layer through at the same time. So um, a even feed foot or a walking foot is a necessity for putting in those straight lines. A lot of times I think, oh, I'm just going to do something small. I don't need to switch over to it. And then you find that as you work your way out, you get this kind of bubble in front of your presser foot. That's the fabric being shoved along and you're going to get distortion in your finish, finished project. So that even feed foot, that um, the walking foot is really important for using when you're putting in straight lines as in stitch in the ditch or just doing straight lines across your quilt. Um, that's a must. If you have a machine that has a dual feed, you'll have something like this. It also attaches to, um, to the back of your back of your machine this plugs into the top and it does the same process but instead of having feet on the bottom it has a um a belt that moves along and helps to walk the fabric through the machine so if you have something like this this is most common on uh, a lot of machines this is on some of the higher end machines the built-in walking foot or integrated walking foot is a bar that comes down onto the presser foot. You don't have to change the foot itself. It helps you work the fabric through. So there are many options on machines. All those are for doing straight line. When you go to free motion, 
you're going to be dropping the feed dogs. So if you haven't done that before on your sewing machine, you'll need to get out the manual to figure out how to drop the feed dogs because now you're driving the quilt. You're in charge of the stitch length and what direction you go. And in that case, you're going to be using a free motion foot or a darning foot um, that will be kind of a hopper foot on your um, quilt. It keeps the quilt down so that as the needle passes down, up and down through it, that your um, quilt doesn't come back up again. So a free motion foot um, or a darning foot called on some machines is what you're going to use for that free motion ability when you drop the feed dogs and now you're in control of the quilt sandwich as it goes through the machine. Karen has a question. It sounds like you were watching me this past weekend when I was quilting my first quilt top. Um, yep, because we've all been there. <laughs> we all have that first quilt, the second quilt, the third quilt, and the 110th quilt. We all go through the same process. We all look and say, do I leave that? Do I take it out? Am I frustrated? Just remember to breathe, number one. You need oxygen to the brain in order to do it smooth. So do it in small bites. Try not to sit and do the entire section or quilt top at once. Try to work on a section. Say, I'm going to do this 15 by 15 area. And when I have it done, I'm going to walk away. And then I'm going to come back and do another section. Because the stress in your shoulders, the stress in your arms, the stress in your fingers, it all works together. We need to be able to relax. So try not to do too much at once. Um, I know it's kind of addicting when you get into it and you think, oh, I'm just going to do this or I'm just going to do this portion. And then all of a sudden you realize it's an hour later and you are so tense. Um, some people put music on, some listen to the radio to help them kind of get a rhythm to their um, machine quilting. Um, Teresa would ask if I would talk a little about batting. There are so many choices. Um, we do have, hopefully the, my moderator can find it. We do have, um, a discussion about battings and I went through a whole variety of battings. So I hope that he will be able to find that link. And if not, I will find it for you later this afternoon. Um, so that you can learn all about battings because there's, there are cotton battings, polyester battings. There are battings from recycled materials. There are bamboo battings, there are wool battings and different lofts and how they work in different quilts. My go-to, just so you know, my go-to is a blend of, I think it's 70-30. So that it's 70% cotton, 30% polyester, which makes it a little bit cheaper than 100% cotton. It still has the quilt, the that crinkle um, ability, that shrink ability, like 100% cotton. Um, and I like Quilters Dream Select is the brand I like, but there are others that I have used, Hobbs, um, trying to remember any other brand, Warm and Natural. I will use a variety of, of um, battings out there, but um, Quilter Select happens to be, or Quilters Dream, I'm sorry, is my favorite go-to batting. And it's a combination. It's a little bit less expensive than a percent cotton, but has the same qualities very similar to 100% cotton. So hopefully we can get that, um, a link put in there about the batting so you can learn about. That's the value of our website is that we have a wide variety of topics so that at your leisure, when you come up to like, oh, what batting should I choose for a baby quilt or a lap quilt or a quilt that I'm sending to someone in a nursing home, you can go and learn about those battings and the variety that we have. So wonderful um, that... Um, we have that resource for you available. Okay, we are um, getting close to being out of time. We talked about st stitching in the ditch. That was the last thing I had on my um, on my list here. Um, getting that the bones so that you don't have a lot of shift in your quilting. Um, and the last thing I want to remind you is keep the the density. The, the distance between stitching about the same throughout your quilt. If you stitch very densely in the center of your quilt, you're going to pull or draw the center. If you do it very loosely on the outer edge, you may have a warping effect. So try to keep the density of your quilting even all the way to the outer edge of your project. And we will do more on machine quilting. So put in some more questions. Give me topics for the for another a live event 
talking about machine quilting on your domestic machine because we have so many questions and I will try to address in future um, episodes and live events. So thanks for joining me today.